All right. So welcome, everybody, to uh, URI's first webinar on Saffron, the first of, of several that are, are going to happen this year and then for a few years to come, we hope. Um, I'm Heather Fobert. I work at URI. I've been there. It'll, I'm, I have to, I'm pretty proud of this. I, it's going to be 40 years for me at URI in May. So the big 4-0 in May. Thanks. Yeah. Um, so it's been all fun and games. I, I do what's called the plant clinic. I, I, um, I, I solve problems with for, for people that have plant problems, whether insect disease or weed problems. And then I, I work with farmers in Rhode Island. And so um, I'm hoping, I know we've got some farmers on here with us today, and I'm hoping that uh, they'll consider saffron for a crop. Okay, what I'm gonna do is start sharing my screen. All right. Oh, ha ha ha. I, did, I meant to go back to the beginning of this. This is my first time actually hosting a Zoom. I've been on about 30 million Zooms in the last year, uh, but this is my first time really hosting. So Kate Venturini is uh, so kind to be here as my backup. Um, but I just want to talk to you for, for a few minutes about saffron because I actually know not very much about saffron. It's I just in the last year, uh, that I've been paying any attention to saffron at all. So, but saffron is a, a good potential crop for Rhode Island and, and New, New England, Southern New England is what we're focusing on. And this is, be, um, we're able to provide this to you today because of funding opportunities from Rhode Island DEM and Northeast SARE, and then also just the University of Rhode Island. So this is being recorded, this I put in to remind myself to record. So that's what that slide's about. So um, saffron, if you're looking to expand your growing season, uh, saffron could really fit in very nicely. It can, it can fit into an existing farming schedule very well. Uh, that's my daughter, Holly, there helping harvest this past October or November. So the, the way, it could, because it can, fit into a farming um, schedule now is because you the, the corms get planted in July or September. So yeah, you're busy on the farm then, but then the corms can last for several years. And when you do the harvest is like mid-October to November, uh, and then the plants grow throughout the winter. So you have green leaves until about June, and then the plants are dormant all summer long. Uh, this picture was taken in uh, the mid-October, October 19th of this past year. So it's really kind of an upside down plant um, compared to the most of the crops that we grow or any of the crops that we grow. So, but then the harvest, as I said, it's harvest is from like middle of October into November. It's pretty intensive. You harvest every day, um, as I said, mid-October to November for about 20 days straight. Uh, so I, I say this because, uh, you know, big saffron production is not for the faint of heart. So, and then that same day that you uh, harvest the flowers, you are also separating the stigmas from the flowers that same day. My daughter, Holly, again, helping. And then you are also drying them the same day. So there's quite a bit of work, especially during peak harvest, there could be quite a bit of work. Uh, the, the picture on the right is a commercial dehydrator that Fari and Rebecca use. And this is my 40 year old Snackmaster Junior dehydrator that I was using because I planted uh, about 75 saffron bulbs in September and really had fun with them and got to dry some of the stigmas in my little uh, Snackmaster Junior. So, but then once it's dry, um, then then the then the work can stop for a while. You you want to store the saffron stigmas for um, a few months and before you then sell it. So this, as I said, I have um, uh, just seventy five corms that I planted in my yard, and this is what it looked like in the end of December. So it's really a crazy plant, and it's perfectly green. It looks pretty similar out there right now. Uh, the main speaker today is Dr. Farid Gresham, who he grew saffron in Iran, in Iran for 12 years. Uh, and then for the past four years, he has been here in Rhode Island, very successfully growing saffron. Uh, this is uh, Dr. Brown. Uh, Farid works for Dr. Brown as a postdoc. And Dr. Brown is our um, URI's vegetable and turf professor. 
So here is Rebecca speaking at a twilight meeting uh, when we used to have in-person twilight meetings. Um, so I am going, we have got a video that Fari recorded. Fari, as I said, he's from Iran. Um, and so he has a little bit of an accent. So we pre-recorded this so that we could add um, closed captioning so everybody can hear what is being said. So let me pull up his, his talk. Hi, everyone. Thank you for attending this uh, webinar. My preferred name is Fari, and I'm so happy to have this opportunity as a presenter, and I can share something about Saffron briefly. Once upon a time, Hermes, son of Zeus, and god of trade, and his best friend with name Crocus, who was a young human and mortal, were practicing their discus uh, throwing. Greek god accidentally hit Crocus on the head and wounded him fatally. As he fell to his death, three drops of blood fell into the center of the Crocus flower, forming the three stigmas which constitute the saffron. Although saffron considered as a plant, indeed saffron is the dry stigma of Crocus sativus flowers. The presentation has not begun yet, but we have reached <laughs> the yummiest part of it. Saffron is well known uh, a spice that has a lot of importance in pharmaceutics, uh, cosmetics, perfumery, and textile industries. Saffron is used worldwide to flavor foods and dishes, including cheese, ice cream, yogurt, confectionery, and sweeties, bakery products, meat, seafoods, and soups. Also, because, because of uh, its color and taste can be used in many types of alcoholic beverages. Because of the high price, saffron has been used as a fabric dye in luxury organic uh, textiles. These days, scientists, scientists work on extracting the biological components from saffron that can be used as an anti-carcinogenic medicine in human health and as a biocide in organic and sustainable agriculture. Nearly a key a focus area for market traders is consumption in the pharmaceutical industries because saffron components are used as an antioxidant, antidepressant, and antiseptic. Saffron uh, traditionally is also used as a treatment of asthma, coughing, and dry skin. Saffron can grow between 30 and 50 degrees northern latitude. Saffron habitat uh, began from the edge of the dry zone uh, to the continental climate zone. The best conditions for growing saffron are wet and temperate climate. Saffron even grows well in more arid regions where winter are cold and summer are hot. Saffron is cultivated in very different environmental conditions with good results. By checking the left map, it seems most part of the United States can be suitable habitat for saffron. The world desertification map on the right shows a drastic loss of uh, an appropriate environment for many crops. Precisely in the same latitude that we have on the left map. The removal of vegetation by human activities, changing climate and lack of precipitation in this area can make the land infertile and unusable for farming. Anyway, due to the climate change and the water crisis, many crops have been shifted to northern latitudes. So don't forget that climate change can also change the growth potential of plants in northern latitudes. 
And maybe we can call this situation an opportunity. Let's come back to the United States. This map shows the increase in frost-free season land from 1958 to 2012. In the Northeast, on average, the frost-free season increased about 10 days in the last six decades, and maybe an excellent opportunity for testing different and uncommon crops in the Northeast. Why saffron in Rhode Island? According to American Farmland Trust, just from 2002 to 2007, in five years, more than 85,000 acres of New England's most productive farmlands has disappeared to a sprawling development. Massachusetts uh, lost 18% and Rhode Island lost 22% of their farmlands. On the one hand, small farm, high cost farming and climatic limitations. And on the other hand, rising house, housing prices cost farmland to lose. Based on the USDA report in 2018, the most expensive farmlands are in the Pacific, the Corn Belt and the northeast regions but if you check the farmlands rent in this table interestingly you can see the rent in northeast despite the farm's value is so cheap which shows the farming in this area is not as profitable as other parts of the u.s This map shows the farm's income and as you can see, northeastern uh, farmers have a problem with their investment in farming. See the light gray color of the northeastern uh, states that shows how low their income is. I began with the uh, climate situation and then showed you how the farmers in northeast are under economic uh, pressure. One of the best way for us is to change our farm pattern and uh, plant high value alternative cash crops. I hope I could show uh, why it encourages us uh, to work on saffron as an alternative uh, crop. Here I want to talk about botany of saffron. Saffron is fall flowering perennial Joe fighter vicious plant without a stem. The plant reaches a height of 8 to 12 inches. Each flower has three uh, sepals and three petals with purple color and completely similar. Also, each flower has three uh, golden yellow stamens and one red pistil. This pistil has three stigmas or filaments, which when dried up, gives the spice saffron. Onion-like solid bulb in saffron is named corm. Each corm has uh, 5 to 11 narrow true leaves, such as a grass's leaf, and can produce between 1 to 4 fragrant uh, flowers. Non-photosynthetic and transparent leaves protect true leaves and flowers till they emerge from the soil. Flowering time and above-ground growth are controlled by uh, temperature and soil moisture. In dry zone, uh, flowers are the first limbs that appear from the ground in, in mid-fall after uh, watering. 
But with early irrigation or wet soil conditions, something like soil conditions that we have in the fall, leaves will be the first limbs out of the ground. Saffron is a triploid plant, completely sterile, and does not set viable seeds. Therefore, the crop must be propagated by small corms uh, or cormlet multiplication. A corm survives for only one season after reproducing cormlets, and at the end of the growing season, the mother corm is consumed uh, by the, the other corms of Crucus sativus. Here you can see a peeled corm. Naturally, the other corms grow on the top of mother corm. The apical buds are dominant, but in case of loss, the apical buds, uh, lateral buds can be replaced and save the mother corm's life. The uh, life cycle of saffron begins with flowering and above ground vegetative growth which requires uh, fall rains or irrigation. Vegetative growth continue, continues for all the winter and most of the spring. As you see, saffron corms dormancy begins in middle of the June and continues till September. The transition to the reproductive phase occurs shortly after corms deep dormancy. In this section, I'm going to talk about soil preparation and saffron planting. Soil preparation is carried out by deep plowing either in the late spring or late summer and further tillage at the time of planting, which could be in June or in September, depend on the uh, uh, planting time. The land might be plowed to a depth of 10 to 12 inches to loosen the soil and control weeds, then land left uh, fallow. Just before planting, depending on the soil organic matter content, adding uh, the composted uh, animal manure is suggested. In soil with less than half a percent organic matter, usually about 20 metric tons per acre of composted animal manure uh, is spread over the ground. Then manure and soil are incorporated with deep plowing before planting. Also, based on the soil test results, synthetic or organic uh, NPK fertilizers must apply before final plowing. Saffron yield in soil that having high organic content, high organic matter, uh, increased significantly. And fertile soil is the basis for good saffron production. Planting method and corm spacing are depend on the irrigation method, uh, labor cost and labor accessibility. In dry zone, because of the water limitation, basin uh, irrigation is preferred. In this method, uh, saffron is usually planted manually in the leveled ground, and farmers plant the bunch of corms in the holes those dug by shovel. The usual spacing between holes is about 10 to 12 inches, and the planting depth is at least 8 inches. This method is less acceptable because of uh, labor cost. And also in this way, with control and using tractors is very difficult. Raw planting, even without furrows, is better for further operation in the field. As I said, furrow planting is more suitable for mechanized systems. Corms are planted in the furrows. Those have been made by the small orchard tractors. In this way, the fir at first, furrows are made, 
then corms are located in the furrows by uh, labor hands. In such a way, the corm bases are in contact with the bottom of the furrow and uh, the grower points are located upward. And then the soil from the uh, adjacent furrow covers the corms. In this uh, system, corms depth generally is 8 inches and distance between rows is up to 14 inches. Some big saffron farmers use a small saffron planter or modified potato planter that both of those uh, are highly applicable and economically profitable. For example, typically uh, about 30 laborers a day are needed to plant one acre of saffron. But with these modified potato planters or uh, saffron corn planters, only uh, less than two hours of labor is needed. Saffron corn planter uh, has the ability to plant corms with eight inches distance between rows and three to six inches distance uh, within the row with the planting depth of three, uh, six inches. After all, this is my favorite planter that is a modified single mold board plow by adding a falling pipe uh, and this model of planter might be the cheapest and simplest implement for uh, small farms. Although saffron irrigation is not considered in New England, but different cultivation patterns are generally uh, selecting based on the type of the irrigation. So I will talk about watering and planting method here in this section. When saffron is planted in rows by hand, the space between rows might be about 10 inches and the space uh, within the rows is about 3 or 4 inches and preferably uh, with the zigzag pattern. This pattern normally used for furrow irrigation. If saffron is planted into the raised bed or in leveled plots, Corms distances are about four to five inches for both between and within the rows. But it's important that laborers and tractors must have enough space to move and work between plots uh, or between raised beds. This planting pattern uh, is suitable for uh, sprinkler irrigation. For the basin irrigation method, the depth and gap between and within the rows are almost identical. And also, uh, corms usually plant uh, as a bunch in one planting point. Fall and winter weeding are usually done manually. But weeding in the summer times can be done mechanically uh, by using small tractors because all the corms are dormant at that time. In some countries, if the farm is not organic, farmers use selective herbicides. As I said before, the other corms are growing on the top of the mother corms and after two uh, or three years, corms depth will be so shallow and based on that, some farmers prefer to spread about two inches of soil on the field, uh, on the top of the field after the fall weeding. But don't forget, for using the soil, we need the soil free of weeds, rhizomes, and uh, weed seeds. It is clear, more weeding is better than less, but at least three crucial phases of weeding are necessary in saffron farm. One, after flowering time and harvesting in the fall. Two, weeding in March or April. Uh, one and two, these two steps eliminate the winter weeds. And three, final weeding is after the first fall irrigation 
and before flowering times. They are so crucial in saffron. This slide shows a saffron fields, those planted in different ways that I talked about before. We are not going to talk about uh, saffron field and saffron after flowering. And we will uh, speak about flower harvesting, uh, handling, and saffron processing later in another webinar in the fall, I hope, and before the harvesting season. I added this slide uh, to give you an idea about saffron field views in different seasons. And in the top right photo, um, you can see the multi-rose planting beds uh, that I uh, talked about before. Saffron pest and diseases. Although saffron is well known as a low pest crop, but it's not free of the pest and diseases. Most of the soil or compost born fungi like Aspergillus, uh, Penicillium, Fusarium and Rhizopus can cause corn rot under the soil. In general, infected corns are rotten but some signs uh, can be visible above the ground. For example, rhizoctonia as a sign usually is neck or uh, crown rot. And fumago shows itself as a smog on the surface of the corms in addition to the leaves. We must remember fungal uh, diseases almost infect the injured corms that have exposed wounds. Sorting and planting healthy corms, having good drainage and removing and burning the infected corms can reduce the risk of the uh, root rot. In severe cases, using uh, fungicides can help. Generally, Mites, blister beetles, and trips are the most common insect pests for saffron. Mites infested corms usually produce short yellowish leaves. And if you see these problematic uh, leaves in your field, you should dig up the corms in the infected area and burn them. Mighty sites are suggested for the severe cases. Yellow and white spot on the leaves and fields uh, silver color appearance from the floor are good signs of the thrips uh, presence. But the good news is these infestations are not too problematic and thrips and blister beetles don't do much damage to saffron because as you know, saffron is a fall and winter plant, especially here in Northeast. Saffron in defenseless area is an excellent source of green leaves for deer and rabbits from November through uh, early spring. Damage from deer and rabbits looks similar since uh, both of those uh, chew saffron leaves. Using a liquid fence as a repellent could be effective. But do the rainfall uh, in the fall and, uh, you know, winter, at least three times a spraying of liquid fence is suggested. Burrowing rodents, uh, especially wolves, are the most serious uh, pests in the winter. Saffron corms are the best food source for wolves uh, in the uh, New England in winter. If farmer plant their saffron in raised beds or in small plots using rodent proof planting beds lined with the hardware cloth is so effective. Fencing the field entirely is the best protection, especially in the bigger area and bigger farms. Laying down 
the galvanized hardware cloth on the top of the saffron in the small garden before shoots emerging in the fall can keep rodent out of the planted area. However, hardware cloth on the top of the ground makes uh, weeding so difficult. So it needs to be removed in the summer when plants go dormant for summer weeding. I have finished providing general information about saffron at this point, and I will give you a summary of the experiments performed at the University of Rhode Island. The objectives of our first study that had begun in September 2017 and finished in the early summer of 2020 uh, were to de determine whether saffron could be grown in the open field in the southern part of the ocean state or not. So we wanted to identify the best density of corms to produce saffron and determine whether uh, low tunnels can improve saffron production or not. This experiment had been designed uh, for three years. Two planting densities and two levels of uh, winter protection were tested in this trial. In mid-September 2017, the saffron corms were planted in two densities, 120 and 162 corms per square meter. And we had two different winter treatments. One, low tunnels with the transparent uh, plastic cover over the saffron plots and two, uh, exposed or unprotected plots. From 2017 to 2020, a lot of tunnels in protected plots were installed exactly after flowering season and removed by the end of March. This slide shows how different saffron establishment is in the second year in our experimental field. The result of the statistical data analysis are beyond the uh, scope of this webinar and need more time and explanation. But in short, I can say uh, we concluded that one, saffron could survive and produce a fantastic yield in southern part of Rhode Island. Two, the higher planting density is not recommended since it does not increase yields and further decrease maybe in plant density should be evaluated. And three, uh, low tunnels and winter protection are unnecessary and counterproductive. Our second trial started in 2020, in summer 2020, and as soon as the first experiment was over. The second trial will be completed in 2022. And uh, its title is Co-Cultivation of Saffron and Basil in Rhode Island. Basil seeds were planted at the end of May and uh, seedling trays were kept in the greenhouse for about 20 days. Then basil seedlings have been moved to the uh, farm for hardening before planting. Uh, seedlings have been planted on July 7th. The saffron corm source was our farm and we dug up corms after three years of the first study. Corms were sorted and checked for any possible diseases and insect infections. We chose uh, corms with the weight of between 10 to 15 grams for planting. In addition to intercropping and comparing that with uh, monoculture, we considered other treatments for weed control in saffron's plots as well. Our uh, treatments were one, saffron pure stand or monoculture, 
as a perennial plant and using a tarp in saffron dormancy period to control weeds. Two, saffron pure stands or monoculture as a perennial plant in the bare ground. Three, uh, saffron pure stand as an annual plant and using tarp from spring uh, to September to control weeds in the dormant period of saffron. Four, basil pure stand uh, with black, black plastic mulch and uh, five saffron and basil intercropped along with the black plastic mulch in basil growing period. Saffron as a perennial plant planted from 2nd to 4th of July. After planting saffron mulches and tarps were laid down and basil seedlings as a monoculture and intercropped with the saffron uh, were transplanted on July 7th. Basil harvesting began in the first week of August and continued for about 50 days. And during this time, we were able to have five harvests, five good harvests. As I said early in this presentation, saffron is summer dormant and the flowering trigger is water along with the lower temperature in the fall. Based on watering uh, in September and colder weather in Mediterranean and West Asia's uh, semi-arid regions, usually flowers uh, appear from inside the transplant shield in early fall. So leaves uh, emerge after flowers and vegetative growth uh, continues until early summer. Flowering time and duration of uh, flowering uh, period in different treatments of our study were completely different. In some treatments, flower, flowers appeared before leaves and vice versa. It seems to us it was because of the varying uh, soil temperature and different soil moisture content on the tarp and mulches and bare ground. Although this study has not to be finished yet and final and complete results will release in 2022, but the first year result shows one. Co-cultivation of saffron and basil in the first year is more profitable than uh, their monoculture. Two, saffron yield was not affected by the basil in intercropping. And three, although basil's yield in intercro intercropped with saffron was less than its yield in monoculture, but intercropped was more profitable and uh, made significant revenue. Today, I try to talk briefly about saffron ecology, saffron botany, and its planting operation beside the climate and farm economy in southern part of Rhode Island. But we would have another session to talk about saffron harvesting, saffron handling, and processing. I think the next session would be held uh, in the fall. We don't have your voice. You're muted, Ah, uh, yes. Ah, there we go. Yes. <laughs> Automatic mute. And the last, you missed the last slide. I miss. Oh, sorry. The last slide. No, no problem. <laughs> it was just about, thank you. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> sorry about that, Harry. And about the SAIR and DEM grants. Maybe you can... Okay. All right. I'll talk a little bit about that. Okay. And I didn't invite people to, if they had questions, to write them into the chat. So I don't see, I don't see questions right now. Maybe uh, Rebecca, you could take a peek at that. Um, but I did wanna share a few more slides here. And also Arash here and can uh, 
answer some questions. Right. But, yeah. Yes. Northern states, you know, Vermont, New Hampshire, or something like that. Yes. So we ended here. So, yeah, a couple more th things that I wanted to say, and then we can go back to some questions is as Fari had mentioned, that the quorums live for one year and they each quorum will produce many daughter quorums. Um, so it, it is necessary to dig up daughter quorums and replant every few years. Uh, in, in, at URI, at the agronomy farm, we will be digging up quorums in July. And so we will have quorums to share with people. Uh, we don't know how many we're going to have, but if you are interested in getting some quorums to try out growing saffron at, at, your, at your farm or at, in your garden, uh, email me and um, we'll, we'll figure out how many people want them and how many you're going to get. Uh, you'll need to pick them up. You'll pick them up here at our new food center, the old turf building down near the agronomy farm. And if you send me an email letting me know you're interested in quorums, I will make that happen this summer. Assuming, assuming we don't have you know, something terrible like a bunch of voles coming and eating all our quorums, but we intend to have quorums to give away. Oh, this is where I put in some, okay. So Laura is asking, what is eating the greens on my saffron? Uh, greens, maybe uh, it depends on the uh, something chew, you know, saffron from the base of the stem above the ground, maybe rabbits or deer, or uh, it's depend on how much leaves they uh, lost. You know what I mean? A bunch of leaves or just a leaf? But but this time of year in the winter time, Fari, it's, it's I probably think rabbits. Might be the, or, uh, deers or rabbits might be, yep. OK. Um, Nathaniel is asking if it can be profitable for a small organic farm to grow and harvest saffron. I think so. The price for the organic saffron in California uh, is about $56 per gram. It's about triple of the price of the saffron in, in organic saffron imported, you know, imported to have saffron here. Oh. Absolutely. For the small farms, for family farms, uh, that they no need to have, you know, uh, uh, laborers or something and working with the family filling the time for october and november it's gonna be uh profitable i think i'll just add one thing to that which is that like most of our crops direct retail is probably going to be the most profitable but you need to check what your state regulations are on that uh, because they do vary from state to state Okay, a couple of people have asked where they can buy corms. Uh, maybe uh, in the future we can uh, have enough corms for uh, selling or for giving the farmers. But for now, uh, the, the best things I think is uh, uh, importing uh, uh, corms from Netherlands and uh, as you know, some companies produce uh, corms for selling overseas. And one of those is uh, Arash is here. Arash, uh, are, you there? are you here? Uh, what's the name of the uh, Hans company? Rocco Saffron. Rocco Saffron from, from Netherlands, yep. R-O-C-O, Rocco Rocco Saffron. A yeah. double C. R O double C O. I think. No, it's just just one, one. C. Yeah, R O C O. Row okay. close saffron. Okay. And um, so then the next question, um, Beatrice is asking if we have if you have examples of successful applications in home gardens and small spaces. And I saw another question further down the list about growing saffron in containers. The specialist of con containers is uh, Arash because uh, 
I, I think Arash uh, planted saffron in high tunnel in uh, milk crate, I, I think, milk crate, I think, or cube. I, I, I don't know which one was. Milk uh, do, crate, do I think. Do you need me to answer this question? Yep, sure. Yeah, uh, actually we planted some saffron corms in the milk crates, plastic containers. And the reason was like, Ferry mentioned that saffron has a different life cycle. We can grow that in the fall and winter. So those crates were removable. Uh, you can plant uh, your saffron corns in those milk crates, but you have to be careful. Where do you put the crates? Because if you put them on the bench, cold weather can kill the root system from under the knees. So if you are going to plant them in the milk crates or containers, Put be careful that you wood. put the crates or containers somewhere on the ground to make sure that cold cannot affect the root system as strongly. Thank you. Thank you. Well, that is, I guess, huh? Um, so this one may be actually another question for Arash. Um, Asa is asking how the corms do when the ground is frozen under snow for a long time. And that doesn't happen down here in Rhode Island, so. Oh, they, they, they work very well. You know, we, we a good bl of, blanket, I think the snow is a good blanket, especially in yeah, the cold. Even when we have the snow, so, so far so good. The data that we collected and the observational data that we have seen around here it works very well in this kind of climate condition. You know, when we uh, we plant the saffron corms at the depths of seven, six, seven inches. So they can use the geothermal. And when, if you are in, a, in the area that you have lots of snow over the winter, actually the snow serves like a blanket on the plants and keep the heat for the plants. So uh, no worries about frozen soil during the winter. However, you should be a little bit careful about clay soil, because if you have very heavy soil texture in your farm and you have a cold situation and frozen temperature during the winter, then you may get some problem. I had some plots in somewhere with that situation that I mentioned, and I saw problems in those farms. But as, uh, as far as you have a good soil situation, sandy loamy soil and lighter soil texture, uh, they can survive. Okay. Um, so Beatrice is asking, is, is there any suggested companion plants to keep off pests? Keep off pests? Uh, I'm not sure. Yeah, I maybe, think maybe uh, something like, I, I don't know. We, yeah, we really don't... haven't had much problem with pests though. We're like insects on the plants. The, the biggest pests are the voles and the rabbits and the, and the deer. And so uh, companion planting isn't going to ha help with those. Uh, the, the season is so important, you know, companion plant in the winter, which kind of plant you can have uh, beside the saffron in the middle of the winter. Right. I think, uh, yeah. I don't know. Okay, and then Kathy is asking if there's anything else besides basil that would be suggested for intercropping with saffron. Uh, I have no idea about the another plant maybe uh, in this area, but in uh, arid regions, there is a lot of things, you know, to plant with saffron, uh, for example, peas on, uh, not this kinds of uh, green uh, peas or something like that, the dried one. It's, you know, short time in, in the middle of the uh, uh, spring, they plant them and uh, harvested them. And after that, uh, saffron gonna be dormant to the end of the summer. I have no idea, but we have to try it, you know. We decided to work on lettuce before, but we find just basil, it works great for the first year. Okay. 
Um, Brenda is saying that she's growing 300 corms in a high tunnel. She had a good harvest in 2019, much less in 2020. And does she need to aggressively water in the summer or September or why are her harvests decreasing? We have to check that uh, the corms, are the corms are healthy? Uh, how many corms after planting 300 how many corns she had in the second years and how many other corns produced. I think in the summer, in the high tunnel, gonna be so hot. It's more than 45, 50 degrees, you know, underneath and it's not good for saffron. Saffron can tolerate 40 degrees of centigrade, I mean, uh, 100, 110 and 120 degrees of Fahrenheit underneath the uh, plastic in the greenhouse. Maybe the problem is the high temperature in the uh, summer and maybe, uh, you know, uh, I think just because of the uh, temperature underneath. Yeah, and we did see that under even just the low tunnels, our yields went down. Yeah, the yield was down, yes. Correct. And the, 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 uh, under Law Tunnel, uh, our uh, saffron uh, shelf life, uh, leaf shelf life, were 10 days uh, less than the uh, exposed plots. And, you know, 10 days is a lot, it's a lot of photosynthetic material can produce in 10 days in the uh, early spring and the spring. Okay, Andrew is asking whether bunched plantings require more fertilizing than planting in rows. More fertilizing? Yeah, when you plant them in bunches rather than spread out. Yeah, absolutely. You, you have a competition between corms when you plant them, them uh, you know, as a bunch. You have a lot of the other corms and you have to fit them for having the uh, big bigger the other corms because they are on uh, competition. But uh, bunch, bunch planting is good for area with the, uh, uh, you know, limitation in water, water limitation and uh, dry area, not here. I think the best uh, equidistance physiologically, uh, like other uh, plants is suggested. Okay, Peggy is asking about the differences between spring flowering ornamental crocus that are starting to flower now and mm -hmm. saffron crocus, which flowers in fall. Uh, they're completely, the, the family are the same. The family uh, is the same, but uh, you know, uh, species are different, genesis are different and crocus, all the crocus uh, are different with the saffron, crocus sativus. Okay, um, so let's see. We're, I think we're starting to run out of time here, but... Um... Yeah, maybe just another question, Rebecca. I see. Yeah, you. so Joan is asking how long saffron can be stored and what's the best way to store it? Corms or dry saffron? Um, dry saffron. Dry saffron. Uh can keep their quality for three years if uh, the pa packing is, is suitable, you know. In the dark and dry situation for three years without any, uh, you know, decreasing in the taste and uh, smell, uh, fragrant, but not more than three years. Okay. Um, so there are a few more questions here. Maybe Faree can answer them um, via email or the chat or something. Yeah, sure, sure. Okay, I'm just... happy to uh, answer any question. All right, very good. Okay. And I, I just wanted to say a couple things. So we are following in the footsteps of the University of Vermont, and it, uh, there's so much information at the North American Center for Saffron Research and Development at the U, at the UVM website. And they are having a saffron workshop, which is of course online 
uh, March 11th and, and 18th. And that's from 1 to 4.30 on the afternoon to those two days. And the workshop is for those who grow, sell, or study saffron now or will in the future. So of course, they're going to be covering a lot more information than we did today in our hour. Um, so it's a great, great resource for learning about saffron production. It, it costs $50, but that's for both days of the conference. And um, you can yeah, go to their website to register for, for the co conference. And last I heard that the registration deadline is March 4th. So please do that soon. OK, so thank you very much for joining us. Maybe Furry and I could and Rebecca could stay on uh, to answer some more questions. That might be easier if, uh, if you guys want to do that. Uh, but as, as, uh, as Furry mentioned, we'll have additional webinars well, probably not in July for planting, like I wrote here, but in the fall, certainly for harvesting and, pro and processing saffron, mm -hmm. we'll have webinars later. And also, you can send me an email to get on our group email list. And also, if you're interested in getting some trial corms this summer. Okay, well, thank you so much. And I hope you enjoyed this. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.